Please welcome to the stage Hagar Shamali of Greenwich Media Strategies and our esteemed panel. Thank you, everyone. So great to see you today. I want a show of hands. How many of you know what the metaverse is? <laughs> Most of you. OK, one more question. How many of you have been in the metaverse? Oh, more than I expected. Pretty Pretty OK, good. well, this is a great segue to our panel that I'm very excited about. We are at what I would say the embryonic stage of the metaverse. And there is a lot of potential there for the metaverse, a lot of billions of people who could benefit from the metaverse. There are a lot of also unanswered questions of how the metaverse is going to be governed, how it's going to be regulated, how we can learn the lessons from social media to apply to the metaverse to make sure that it's not abused or exploited for nefarious purposes. So I'm excited about my panel today because they each have a really unique perspective on this. Next to me, I have Brent Harris, who is the VP of Governance for Meta. Next to him, I have Hella Thorning Schmidt, who is Her Excellency. She was former Prime Minister of Denmark, and uh, she is currently the chair, co-chair of the Oversight Board. Um, and next to her, I have Eric Kelly, who is the chairman and CEO of the tech company Overland Trading. So Brent, I'm going to start with you. If you could actually just walk us back and set the stage just to tell us what is the metaverse, what could it or will it look like, and why is it so important? So it's a great question, and there are parts of it that we know, and there are parts of it that I think will be built and that we don't know about yet. So what do we know about what the metaverse will be? We know that it'll be interoperable. We know that there'll be a sense of immersion and space to it, that there'll be a sense of presence that you feel that you don't have today in the internet. And we know that it's not going to be built by any one company. It's going to be built by many different organizations, many companies, and coming together to create the next phase of the internet. And what does that look like in practical terms, or why kind of personally do I work on this? I'll say that one of the things that I think is really exciting about the metaverse is that because of that sense of presence, it breaks down physical barriers. And for me, I often think about my mom, who was, uh, was in a wheelchair her whole life. She's not with us today. And when I was growing up, she actually lost out on a job because it was on the second floor of a building. They hired her in, but they refused to actually accommodate. They said she couldn't do the job from where she was. And what I think is so exciting about what the metaverse makes possible and what you can begin to see in different products like workrooms and others is that actually allows you to come together and feel a part of working together, learning together, and being with each other that just isn't there yet fully on the internet. And that's what we're hoping to make possible. Amazing. You know, you mentioned, I want to build a little bit on something you said about how no one company will own it. And so I want to turn this to Hella a little bit. If you can tell us, you know, you have a lot of experience in oversight and regulation. How do you think the metaverse should be regulated? H how could it be governed? Uh, what lessons from the past, from social media, can we apply to the metaverse? And how? <laughs> Good question. Two words about what we're doing in the oversight board. Uh, we have been working for two years. Meta decided, then Facebook, Meta decided that they wanted an independent body to look at their content moderation. They basically decided we can't do this alone. It can't basically be Facebook or ultimately Mark Zuckerberg who decides what goes up or what uh, is left on the, uh, the platforms of Facebook and Instagram. So the last two years, we have been working with that. We have been taking cases. We have been advising Meta. And what they have committed themselves to Meta is that when we take a decision, they will follow that decision. And that is what they have done. We also issue a number of uh, recommendations. Uh, and they also have to look at those recommendations and have actually adopted most of those recommendations. So our work is not done, but we're in a good process where we are trying to influence Meta to take more principled decisions about which contents get removed and what stays up. And when I say principled, it should be based on the, um, their own community standards, uh, which are actually good. Someone should read them. They're good community standards, but also on top of that, human rights legislation. So our, our common human rights 
body of legislation should also be part of the decision-making when we take content moderation decisions. That is what we're doing. So the next question is, of course, how can the knowledge that we have gained after two years, and I'd like to underline that no one else has done that. No other social media companies have done that. So we are the first of its kind globally. So the big question is, can some of our experience be used for the metaverse? Uh, because the, when, when we started the social, s social media, and particularly f when, when Meta was Facebook, the motto was move fast and break things. Mm. I think we need to go away from that motto, and this time we can't do that. We have to, with the knowledge we have of the complexity of content moderation and what can happen in the metaverse, we have to actually use all our experience that we have ga gathered together to try to, I, would, I wouldn't say regulate, but try to, to put in some, how do we, how do we operate? How do we, what's the mode of operation in, uh, in the metaverse? And I think that is the next step, and we have to move a little bit fast in doing that. Interesting. Um, Eric, I want to I wanna harp for you on your background in tech and in working in government, or sorry, working with the government, and talk, if you could comment a little bit about the government's role, governments around the world, yeah. and the role that they can or should play in making sure that the metaverse remains a safe place, but, you know, and, and how do we walk that line of ensuring that it's safe, it's, it's regulated, it, it, it is there for everyone to take advantage of and for the benefit of people without over-regulation, of course. Well, I mean, um, that's a great question. And I think what she was saying is, I'm one of the old guys here. So <laughs> I've been in the tech, I would never say I've been in the tech industry for, for 40 years, and I can tell you, you know, the metaverse is like starting all over again. Mm -hmm. And I think we've learned a lot about the guardrails that we need to put in place. So I look at it as more, not regulations, but just guardrails so we actually make sure we stay on track because my time you know, working uh, with uh, President Obama on his advanced uh, manufacturing science and technology, it really gave me some insight in terms of the speed of Silicon Valley and the guardrails we need to have to make sure we stay on track. But I think that when you think about the metaverse, it's global. I mean, and so it's not just a U.S. regulatory requirement or guardrails, it's a global guardrails. And so what you're doing, uh, what other countries are doing are gonna be so critical for us to make sure that we're successful. Because when you think about and I, and I kind of envisioned the metaverse, and you know, I was telling my wife, I said, she says, well, the good thing about that is not only will I be able to go online, but I'll be able to have the retail store and be able to shop in Paris sitting you know, on the couch. Uh, so, um, but I think, you know, to answer your question, having uh, a global architecture of guardrails is gonna be so critical you know, in the speed that we're moving with the metaverse. That's right. I feel sometimes it's missing in the social media world yeah. with that respect. So I, I want to flip the coin a little bit and look a little bit at the negative side and knowing what those negative issues might be, how we prevent them. So I have a next generation news media brand. It's Oh My World. It's on YouTube. Please subscribe. Do me that favor. <laughs> um, and Oh My World. And I am excited about the metaverse for that reason. I want to do live events in the metaverse, for example, and anybody around the world could join them. But as a mother of three young children, I am also terrified of the metaverse. And I don't want to see my child with Oculus goggles in his room 24 hours a day. I mean, hopefully I'll have some measure of control over that. But, and, and not really knowing what he's up to and, and what, what experiences he may encounter. So we know of a story of a few months ago that was reported in the New York Times of a woman who went into a virtual game, virtual reality, and within minutes was sexually assaulted. So how are you seeing those experiences and pre preparing to prevent them? What is possible? Can you prevent that from happening? You know, can you please comment and elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, so this is a really important topic of conversation. And some of what we've done as a company is started to set out a set of principles. So we believe that people need to be safe, they need to be secure, we need to be really principled around how privacy is approached in the metaverse. And we also need to find ways to create opportunity and equity and inclusion. So one of the things that will matter is having a guiding set of principles. Principles I think that are different than move fast and break things. And <laughs> I think we've been very conscious in trying to lay those out and articulate and distinguish how we're building it. But in addition to the principles and how the company builds, I think also what's really key is to build together and build in a way that is different than how the current applications have been built. And so what you've seen from us recently around building the oversight board, 
bringing in independent oversight, having a group of people who are experts and uh, are from across the world and challenge our point of view. Hella talked about all the recommendations the board has made, and there's been over 100 recommendations. The board has not been shy on saying <laughs> that there's a lot of ways that this company can improve its existing products. But beyond that, we're also looking for ways to hear from more people on the ground floor. And so we've been talking about things like community deliberations as a way to go out and hear from the people on the products, not just have it designed inside of Silicon Valley, and be able to confront people with, what do you think the right option is? How do we get these guardrails right? How do we build these products right from the beginning? And Heather, can you comment and expand a little bit more on that? On Are there examples you can think of that you saw uh, or still see in social media that you see as an opportunity to fix yeah. going forward for the metaverse? I mean, one of the big things that we have found is, first of all, we want to work on how Meta treats its users. Mm -hmm. Meta doesn't treat their users very well. Uh, they don't give them explanation of why their content has been removed. You hear that? He knows, <laughs> he knows. Oh, yes. yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> and I think we have already improved how Meta treats their users. For example, if a piece of content gets taken down, they have promised us they will actually, if it's taken down by, by a machine or a, a human, they will tell that. Now the people can complain. And one of the things that we're really pushing Meta to do, to just be more transparent with everything they do. Tell us how they're doing things, how they're moderating content, how the machines are working. Tell us those things. And I think we are, we are on a trajectory now where Meta will have to be much more transparent. And I feel that it's that transparency that we have to move in to when we find out how to move on the, on the metaverse. And I think we have had to ask ourselves some really difficult questions. For example, when we combine artificial intelligence with the metaverse, we, you will be able to see an avatar in the metaverse, which is actually a robot. What rights have that what I have that robot, which is an avatar, looks like a person, it looks like our avatar in the, in the metaverse. Has that avatar got free speech? Can it do what it like? Or can we put the same human rights regulation on an avatar in the metaverse? This is just one little example. There will be <laughs> protection, uh, I mean, personal protection in the metaverse so you don't get a, a, a assaulted like you were just talking about. So there are so many issues. And I think the time now is to open all those issues and start talking about it. But also recognizing a meta, even though they changed their name, they won't be able to do this on their own because the metaverse is basically a whole new internet, a whole new internet that we all have to deal with. So it's not even enough to have one oversight board and one meta. We need to expand this conversation and really understand what this is all about. Uh, and I think there's so many great things in the, in, in the metaverse but there will also be negative things and we already and we have to start talking about those. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating and complicated, but it's we have the, complicated. Yeah, we have the opportunity of um, hindsight, right? We have the advantage of hindsight. Yeah. Um, Eric, can you talk a little bit, dive a little bit into the technology piece? Yeah. You have experience, to quote Eric, bridging, bridging the, the um, digital and diversity divide. And how can you do that in the metaverse? What opportunities do you see to do that? How can you get your foot in the door to do things like that? Yeah, I think, you know, this time we have a chance to get it right. Um, we talk about bridging the digital and diversity divide and leveraging technology to do that is going to actually change how we actually operate and work with each other around the world. If you think about what we talk about, global intellect and inclusiveness, in order to be able to do that, there has to be technology. So think about, as you mentioned, an avatar, or you're actually, whether you're in Ghana, whether you're in Japan, whether you're, where you are around the world, be able to bridge the digital and diversity divide, the metaverse is going to be critical for us to be able to do that. Because you think about, you know, whether you look at the reports, you know, there's a report out by, um, I think it's Corn Ferry that says, by 2030, we will have a, was it $8 trillion shortage in revenue because of the, of the workforce talent. It's going to be about 85 million workforce shortage. It's not a workforce shortage in population, it's a workforce shortage in terms of skill set. So think about what you can do with the metaverse to actually close that gap, whether it's training, whether it's actually you know, education, and making sure that you actually bridge that digital and diversity divide because the talent is there, it's just the access 
and this is going to allow them to be able to do that. So I think, you know, when I think about when I first started and the internet started, and you know, I think this time we have a chance to actually get it right, because the focus on the digital and diversity divide, divide is right front and center with us. The metaverse is actually now uh, becoming out of its infancy stage, so I think the combination of those will allow us to actually bridge that digital divide once and for all. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to pose a question that I'd love each of you to answer, which is, what are you, and we'll start with you, Brent, what, it, what are you most excited about with the metaverse uh, and its growth, and also what are you most concerned about in terms of challenges you foresee or things that you might be fearful of? Yeah, well, that's a good one. There's so many things. So on what I'm most excited about, I, I think we took a moment to talk about it, which is I'm really excited about the possibility of breaking down physical barriers. Mm -hmm. So we talked about that with disability, but I also think it matters from a global perspective. How many people are in different places that don't have the opportunity to get training or education that otherwise could be possible if you actually could participate mm -hmm. alongside whoever the best teachers are, wherever the best universities are? There's also opportunities on this to train people with surgery mm -hmm. and in health in order to actually do really technical and hard disciplines where the best way to learn is actually not necessarily on a patient until you really know. And so there's all these applications that I think are really deep that just aren't possible today with the internet. And if we can unlock them and do so in a way that is safe and secure and where everyone can participate, I think that is an immense promise. Um, what most worries me is, will we actually learn from the lessons of the mm -hmm. past? And so how do we actually come forward and start to really think about what hasn't gone well, whether it's with the existing applications or with the existing internet? And having dialogues like this, and I think everyone in this room has an opportunity to think about and reflect and bring forward, what would you like to be different? Who would you like to actually be the decision makers in the future on this? And that, I think, is something that we have to find ways to get right. And everyone has a responsibility to speak up, bring their voice to it, and bring solutions to bear. Mm -hmm. I think that image, by the way, is helpful to a lot of people because people often think of the metaverse, you know, the regular lay person, we think of gaming. And we, think, we hear Snoop Dogg buying some 400 million plot of land or something like this in, the virtual, in virtual reality. And when it's, I think it's really helpful to actually give scenarios of how it could be so valuable to people all over the world. So I appreciate that. Hella, can you, yeah. It, the I, good I, things are what Brent is saying. There'll be so many opportunities. I want to know about specific areas. I want to know about the metaverse today. I want to gather with some people who are interesting and who know about that and I'll convene them and we'll meet globally one day and we'll actually feel that we're in the same room. There'll be so many good things about this. My worry is, of course, that we don't, we leave our humanity outside of the metaverse and don't take our, be our seri not, we're not serious about our values. The great thing about the real world that we are in now is actually that we have developed a way of living with each other. We have developed human rights uh, legislation. We know what those what, what the, that legislation, what that foundation that we all base our life on. We know what kind of values we have. And I'm so worried that we leave that outside in the, in the real world and do not take them into the metaverse. So the next big step is to find out, like we have done with the internet. I mean, the internet, I mean, social media is not a wild west, actually, because we have rules. We take loads of stuff down. We have many rules that, that guides our life in there uh, that are connected to the real world and we need to do the same with the metaverse and I'm so I'm worried that we have to go through a wild west period where we don't have these guardrails as you mm -hmm. so rightly put them and that's why we need to have the conversation like this and start the work now mm -hmm. and I'm I'm sorry but it has to be the big social media tech companies that does this because they have the they have the power to do it like you started us you have to lead the, the way in this this work as well so we're expecting a lot from meta in the metaverse mm -hmm. uh, Eric, if you could well, offer yeah, your I views. think what excites me uh, about this is three things. One, bridging the, the economic equality, bridging health equality, and bridging education equality. Mm -hmm. Because it allows you to reach, as you mentioned, areas and people that we haven't been able to reach before. It allows small and diverse businesses to be able to reach uh, partners, communities, regions, countries that they haven't been able to before. The part that worries me is the cybersecurity place. 
in terms of how do we actually put the guardrails around cybersecurity. That's one of our biggest issues today, whether it's ransomware, whether it's all the cybersecurity happening, and we have to figure out how to stay in front of that. Mm -hmm. um, so technology, I say, can be used for good, and it also can be used for not so good. And so those are really the things that, that uh, concerns me. Right, that makes sense. To, I'm going to end it. I'm going to end it soon. Um, to add to the point about social media and use for and you know good and bad and and how these social media companies are really and tech companies are really changing their culture. Um, I had just last week learned that the Iranian government was impersonating me. Um, there was an account on Twitter, and by the way, they hate when pe I, when people share their tactics. So I want everybody to know that they do that. And they were doing it to reach out to activists and hack their systems. And there was an account on Twitter that someone was impersonating. Um, me as my assistant and within days Twitter took it down I mean yeah. like, it was which I think is fast I mean yeah. I think it was two days from which I had made the report um, they did it super fast and I don't think that that would have been the case five years ago um, so I do you do sense this this culture shift and I think that's promising for the metaverse so thank you for being thank here you. Thank, thank you for your valuable insights thank, thank you, you.